Marco Codes. Today we're going to talk about Spring Boot nice and easy. I'm not going to lie to you, you're not going to learn the whole Spring ecosystem by just watching one single video, but I hope it's going to give you the best jumpstart possible into the whole topic. What are you going to learn? Well, it's simple. Spring Boot is a popular choice if you want to build web applications with Java. Hence, you're going to build a tiny part of a clone of, say, Google Photos. Let's call it a Photos clone. Which means we're going to start with an empty Spring Boot project from scratch. We're going to talk about what the Spring Boot project looks like, what files you can expect, how to build a REST API, how to save data to the database, how to package up your application, send it to a friend or to an investor so you can cash out early and retire and don't have to program anymore. Does that sound like fun? All right then, let's go. Now, the best way to get started with Spring Boot is to go to start.spring.io. It's the official so-called Spring Initializer. It's a project generated by the Spring folks. And you have a ton of options here, and I'm going to walk you through these options. First of all, project, Maven project or Gradle project. The question is, what kind of Java build system should your Spring Boot project use? If you're already used to either Maven or Gradle, then choose your preferred option. Otherwise, I just recommend you to go with Maven because it's slightly simpler to get started with it. The same with language, Java, Kotlin, Groovy. The video is going to be in Java. If you, however, prefer Kotlin or Groovy, then just pick either one of those. Spring Boot version. You've got plenty of versions here, 3.0, 2.64, 2.5. The, the current stable version is highlighted. And you can just go with that, 2.6.4. If you're watching this video in two years time or whenever, it doesn't really matter everything I'm gonna show you, 3.0, 2.5, 2.0, maybe now 1.0 is gonna be valid because we're gonna cover all those basics. And should they change, I'm gonna put the changes into the video's description. Project metadata, group ID, artifact ID. Now, these are basically uniquely identifying your project over the world. What you usually do is you go like com dot company name. Uh, in my case, it will be JetBrains, and then maybe dot Marco because I have several projects under one group ID. Artifact is basically your project ID. As we're building a photo clone, let's call it Photos Clone. The name, yeah, that's fine. Description, demo project for Spring Boot is also fine. And then the package name. As you can see, what the generator did is take your group ID, com JetBrains Marco, appended photos clone, and that's your package name. And it's going to create a couple of Java classes and put those into that package. The thing is that Java packages with a dash are basically invalid. So what you have to do is you have to delete the dash and you have to replace it with a dot. It's a tiny bug in the project generator. Pa packaging jar file, war file, just go with jar file. You're going to learn at the end what that actually means when you package up your application as a jar file and you can run it on any system that has Java installed. Java version, if you don't have a great reason to either stick with Java 8 or 11, just go with the latest one, 17. Just make sure you have it installed on your PC or Mac or Linux machine, whatever. Dependencies. You have a couple of dependencies, basically a gazillion of different dependencies. I'm not going to tell you exactly what each of these dependencies does. What you want to do, you want to write a REST API. That means you want to accept JSON, you send JSON back to the user, to the browser. For that, you only need one dependency, and it's a, whoops, Spring Web dependency. Here we go, you have to actually scroll up a tiny bit. Spring Web, RESTful applications, uses Tomcat, a web server, an embedded web server, and allows you to create JSON and send it back and forth. That's all we need. And then also, maybe for later, we want to connect to a database. And there's several different ways of doing that. And if you have been using Spring Boot before, you might be used to JPA, Hibernate, and the whole Spring Data Umbrella project. I don't want you to go with Spring Data JPA for now because I think it's slightly more complex for beginners. I want you to go with Spring Data JDBC for the moment. We're going to start with the very basics. And then later on, you can always replace your code with JPA specific stuff. So pick Spring Data JDBC. And the last dependency, we want to connect to a database. Now, I could have gone with Postgres, MySQL, all good databases, Oracle, whatever. As a jumpstart, I want you to pick H2, the H2 database. Why? Because you don't have to install it. 
You can simply add a dependency to your Spring Boot project, and then an in-memory database will be created for you that basically looks like and feels like a real database that you have to install. And you're gonna, you're gonna learn later on in this video how to handle an H2 database. That's all you need to do. You now need to click Generate, which means your creative project gets downloaded, Photos clone here, and we can start coding some crazy shit. Well, let's actually do one thing before that. Let's open up the download folder and extract your project, extract all. I'm just gonna put it into my code folder. That's where the project should live. That's part number one. And we can now, you have a directory there, we can open it up. The question is, how do we open up the project? Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to use an ID. You can, in fact, if you have a preference already, if you have a preferred ID, choose that one. If you want to go with a text editor only, like Vim or Emacs, that's also fine. I'm just gonna show you a couple of things with IntelliJ. And when I Google for download IntelliJ, you can see there's an ultimate version, which is a paid version, and there's a free community version. You can just download the free version and you're gonna be fine. Other than that, download the IDE, open it up, and I'm gonna see you back in a second. Welcome to IntelliJ. That's right, let's open up the project. Just click open project, then I have the folder here already selected. I'm just gonna go with highlight photos clone, hit okay, and IntelliJ is gonna open up the project. Who would have thought? Now, the thing is, there's a couple of dependencies being downloaded, indexing going on. But in any case, while that's happening, let's have a look at the project structure, whatever Spring Initializer created. It's a very simple Maven project, as you can see, because it has a POMXML file. When you open up the POMXML file, which is Maven specific, let's go through a couple of those XML tags you see there. Now, essentially, group ID, artifact ID sounds familiar because you put those values into Spring's initializer page. Version 001 snapshot means you don't have a 1.0 release version, it's a work in progress snapshot version. The name, description, yeah, whatever. Properties, Java version 17, that's because we picked Java 17, and depending on what you picked, you might see 11 or 8 here, I dare you. Dependencies. You can tell Maven to download dependencies for you. And as you can see, we put all the dependencies here that, or rather the Spring Initializer put the dependencies here that we chose on the website. Spring Boot Starter Web, that's the web dependency with your embedded web server. Spring Boot Starter Data JDBC, you know, gives you the capabilities to access databases later on. Your H2 database dependency and a dependency for testing. So as you can see, a bit of metadata in the POMXML file, a couple of dependencies, and if we need to add dependencies later on, we're just gonna put them into the POMXML file, but I'm gonna explain that later again. Then we have Maven W, Maven W command is the Maven wrapper, which means your project comes with an embedded Maven version, and you don't need to download Maven for the whole project to work. You can just use Maven W, on Linux, Mac OS, or mavenw.command on Windows to execute all the Maven commands you want later on. Then we have a source folder. Source folder, source main, Java, pretty standard Maven directory structure because your Java classes are gonna live in a package, remember, from a second ago, com jetbrains marco photos clone. There's one Java class that the Spring initializer put there. Source main Java, my application. We're gonna have a look at that in a second. Resources, source main resources. We have a properties file where we can, can configure a ton of stuff for later on about our Spring application. Static templates folders if we want to write HTML pages, static ones or dynamic ones. We have a test folder, source test Java, where there's a lonely test class inside, but that in fact is what our Spring Boot application at the moment consists of and we want to have a quick win. So we're gonna open up your Photos clone application and you can see it's an application which essentially has one method, a main method, and it runs some spring specific stuff and puts your class inside that method that it executes. And in fact, what the method does is it basically boots up Spring Boot, which means booting up your embedded web server. And after a second, we should be able to see something in the browser. Which means let's click run photos application or just, you know, execute the main method, whatever way you like. It's gonna take a second and then we're gonna see some console output. 
Console output, yes, Spring Boot 264 is booting up. And then we have a couple of log messages here. And as you can see, you can read all those lines, but what is important, starting service Tomcat, which means your web server is being booted up. Tomcat started on port 8080. That sounds good. Well then let's open up a browser and see if something is, or something works already. Localhost 8080, bam. We get an error message 404, which says nothing found, which is actually what we're expecting because our Spring application cannot do anything yet. There's nothing to accept JSON messages or send it back to the front end. So 404 is pretty good because it means our application actually booted up. And now we need to change that by building our REST API. Hold on, not so fast. I want you to go away with a success message now instead of saying an error message. So we need to have some sort of hello world here. Which means what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new class inside our base package next to Photos clone application. Just create a new Java class and we're gonna call it Photos Controller. I just love this Z here. Now, inside that method, what's gonna happen is imagine we just want to say hello world on the website. So you're gonna write a method calling public string uh, hello and you're going to return the string hello world. Right, a simple Java class. The thing is now Spring doesn't understand what that class is supposed to do. We're going to change that. We're going to add a couple of annotations and many things in Spring Boot work with annotations as some sort of marker annotations to tell Spring do something special with that class. The first one is going to be the add rest control annotation. So you just start writing add rest controller, right? Click enter and then IntelliJ imports the right class. What happens now is when you start the Spring application, Spring will look at all the classes inside your package and actually also in all the sub packages of your application class and see, hey, do I have, do I know any REST controllers? If Spring knows REST controllers, it says, okay, let's create a new instance. We're gonna talk about that of Photos controller for the user, so for me, for the developer. And then those methods, you know, are special. We need to do something with those methods. But again, there's something missing on the method. Spring doesn't know to do what to do with the hello method. More specifically, we need to map it. Mapping it means we need to decide, hey, the user, the browser is gonna send HTTP GET requests to our server. The path is going to be slash, for example, if we just want to localhost 8080 slash, yeah, we want to respond to that. So what we're effectively saying, now this REST controller here has one method which should be executed by Spring whenever a request hits the endpoint slash with the HTTP GET method. You could also have, you know, the post mapping or delete mapping or whatever you ha have you, uh, if you have different HTTP methods involved. But for now, we're just gonna go, not with JSON any getter, we're just gonna go with GET mapping, right? Good, now by default, when you just run an application, Spring doesn't automatically reload and register those new methods. So what we have to do is you have to stop your application and run it again, or just click the rerun button, which I conveniently missed. And I'm going to show you ways how to, you know, go get around that later on. Now, when I scroll to the right, it still looks the same, localhost 8080, that seems fine. So let me open up a browser again, localhost 8080, refresh, and yes, I can see hello, hello world. That's great. So what we just learned is essentially, if you want to build you know, the tiniest possible, let's not even call it a website, just a page with hello world string, it is enough to create one REST controller. Spring, when you boot it up, is able to understand what you want, just you know, execute the method and return the string hello world whenever someone sends a GET request. Pretty cool. And let's talk about our REST API finally. Okay, let's quickly think about our photos clone. Essentially, what we want to what we want the front end to be able to do is take some photos and upload them to the server, which means we're gonna end up with something a lot of Java business applications end up with. Meaning, we want to be able to create photos. We want to be able to read photos, like getting them and seeing, you know, specific photos. We want to be able to update them. We want to be able to delete them. That means we're building a CRUD REST API, create, read, update, delete REST API. Now, when you think about a photo, 
usually, well, let's give a photo an ID, so uniquely identifying it. A photo usually also has a file name when it comes from your camera or whatever, and the photo has some image data, the raw bytes, obviously. And then you have a ton of other things like timestamps, whatever. Let's just think of a photo for now as a combination of an ID and a file name, and even the image data will come a tiny bit later. Let's create a so-called photo model class, which means in your package, and I'm going to put everything into one package for now, and at the end, we're going to refactor it to make it look a bit nicer and idiomatic. So don't worry about that for now. Just create a new class, public class photo. Private string ID. We want to give the photo an ID. We want to give the photo a file name. And then later on, we have the raw data also that we'll need to add. Then in Java land, for now, there's a couple of ways of doing it, but you want to add, for now, getters and setters also to your photo class so that, you know, every third party dependency in Spring Boot that takes your photos and converts them to JSON, for example, work without any workarounds or without any problems. So just have that tiny photo class. And then what I think about when I think about, you know, writing REST service or whatever, I always like to start from the top, which means at some point, what I want to do is I want to have a gap mapping. I want to react. I want my photos controller to react to the URL photos. With that, under that URL, I just want to return any photo that my database has. At the moment, we don't have a database yet. Doesn't really matter. I'm just going to write out what I want my application to do. So at some point, what I want, there should be a list of photos returned. The method, method is, let's call the get, for example. I'm going to make sure the import is right here to Java util list. And then we're now, we, I want to return a list of photos. We don't have any photos yet. We're going to change that because we're just going to say, well, inside here, there's a list of photos and it's my database, new list of, right? And then we're just going to create a new photo. The photo obviously needs an ID and it needs a file name. So we're just going to quickly add a new constructor here. And as you can see, I like to use all these IDE features to switch back and forth and not just have everything planned out perfectly at the very beginning of when we, when we start. Right, that is fine, actually. The new constructor is here. Always make sure to have an empty constructor also, because again, otherwise, you'll have some issues with converting your Java class to JSON uh, back and forth. I'm going to show you that in a bit later. Right, so now here we have our new photo. Let's see, the photo needs an ID. Let's call it one. And the photo has a file name of hello JPEG. Well, now well, the only thing we need to do is our get method now returns the list of mocked photos, right? That is fair enough. We're now going to rerun the application again and see if we get a success message. If Spring Boot is smart enough to understand, hey, photos should return you a list of photos. And then Spring Boot internally will take the list and convert it to JSON so that we should actually be able to see it in our browser, right? Let's see. Localhost 8080. Hello world. Localhost 8080 photos. Yes, that kind of worked. No, not just kind of, it worked. So we can see here's our JSON array. ID1 file name hello.jpg. Perfect. Let's quickly continue with the gets because what I also want to do is I want to be able to get a specific photo, which means I'm going to duplicate the method. Don't worry, it's red at the moment. Doesn't really matter. Get comfortable with files being read. Because what I want to do is I'm going to change the get mapping because I know that I want to have some sort of an ID parameter behind photos to access a specific photo. At the moment, we only have the ID one. So, you know, uh, everything else should give me a 404. Which means that this ID from the URL somehow needs to get passed into my method. String ID like so. And what you need to do again with Spring Boot, you need all these marker annotations. So think about markers, markers, markers um, at path variable. This annotation tells Spring Boot, hey, if you have in the mapping some parameter with curly braces called ID, and if I have by accident a method parameter, which is also called ID, just put whatever is in the ID curly braces into the method string parameter. Does that make sense? Hopefully, right? 
Now we need to do a couple more things because obviously our method doesn't return a list of photos, it should just return one specific photo or, you know, a 404 error message. Now, the thing is, we cannot return our database, our list of photos here anymore. And actually, I'm just going to rewrite things a tiny bit because it's going to make it a bit simpler in the long run. So instead of having a list of photos, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a map of photos. So my database is now going to be a new hash map, right? Like so. Make sure the import is right. And now I'm going to do something ugly and dirty. I'm going to quickly initialize my hash map here. So I'm just going to say put ID number one, I'm going to put my new photo here. Like, so that's my database. I can remove my list now. Then down here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a get on the hash map. So I'm just going to return a specific photo. And over here, what I want to do for all the ones, for all photos, I want to return uh, DB values, which will just give me all the different photos from my hash map. But unfortunately, that returns a collection, not a list. So I have to quickly, you know, change my method parameter. Even that IntelliJ can do for me, or you just, you know, instead of list photo, you write collection photo here. One last thing, this only works if you essentially have a photo available. If we don't have a photo available, what I want to do is I don't want to return a null value. I want to return a 404. In the spring world, you do that with throwing exceptions, specific exceptions. So what you can do is you can say if photo equals null, for example, you throw a new response status exception, which allows you to say, hey, I want to return a specific HTTP status, which usually is not found 404, right? So let's try and get a photo from the database by specific ID. If the photo is null, then say 404, otherwise return the photo, right? Let's see if that works. We're going to restart the application again. Open up the browser. Refresh the page. That still worked. Let's see. When I go with photos 2, I get a 404 error message. Photos 1, I get my photo. And it's not an array. It's just my JSON object. That is pretty cool. Now, let's quickly do something else. What we could do is we could say, let's just, I, I like copy and pasting so much. So instead of, let's say we want to delete photos, delete mapping, because you want the method to be able to respond to delete requests. Delete, delete. Let's say the um, method again doesn't, re it doesn't really return anything. You just want to, again, have an ID. You want to, I copy and pasted the wrong method. Photos, ID, like so. Make sure you have the path variable inside here as well, or otherwise things won't work. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna do the same thing, actually not the same thing, but we're gonna say db remove ID. If the object existed, we're gonna get it here. And then it's also removed from uh, the map. And if it didn't exist, so if the photo is null here, then we say, well, we didn't find a photo to remove, right? So let's try it out. We're just going to restart the application once more. You can see a lot of restarting going on. Browser, we're going to go to Photos 1. But hey, let's wait a minute, because my browser, I can, you know, refresh the page and I'm going to get get calls. But how do I execute a delete call from my browser? Well, the thing is, IntelliJ has a nice little REST client, which I could use in the Ultimate Edition. I'm not going to show you that because I'm just going to show you the bare bones version of what you could do. And what you could do is you want to open up the DevTools, right? You want to go to your console, and then I'm linking the source code down below. What you essentially can do, you can just, you know, execute a await fetch call to localhost 8080 photos with your ID and the HTTP method delete. I'm just going to put in, you know, five as my ID to that method, a tiny snippet of JavaScript, the poor man's version of my REST client. I'm just going to execute that. And I can see when I execute this call, I get a 404 because the photo doesn't exist. Now let's see what happens. If I put ID number one inside here, I actually, that looked good. Now when I refresh my page, 
I get a 404 error message. My photo is gone, right? Photos just returns me an empty list of photos. And that's exactly what I wanted. So, so far what we have is we have a tiny, you know, mock database. It's just a hash map for now. We have our get methods working. We have a delete method working. Now it's about time we create a post mapping because we want to be able to create or to post new photos. Right, so post mapping. What we're gonna do is the UL is just this. We're just gonna say create is the method name. There's not gonna be a path variable string ID because now the, what we want to have, it's basically we want the front end to send in some JSON and then Spring Boot should convert that JSON to a photo object and then we can just, you know, handle the photo object directly. Now we're gonna say, well, the only thing that we need to do is in our database, we need to put our photo with its ID and we're gonna say, well, we're just gonna put the photo there. The interesting thing is the front end shouldn't generate the ID, we should generate the ID. So let's quickly set photo set ID. And then for now, we're just gonna put it to a random UUID, a long string basically, which is random. And then we can return our photo here also. So we're just gonna say, well, let's return the JSON object effectively with the newly set ID. I'm just gonna hit Alt Enter. That's all what I, what I do in IntelliJ. Whenever there's an error, I don't, you know, <laughs> fix the error myself. I just go Alt Enter and hope that IntelliJ basically fixes the project for me. So that's how we would create a photo. Just gonna clean up the path here. Let's see, we're just gonna go photo in here without any validation for now. I just want to see if the basics are working or if I missed anything. So I'm just gonna restart the server. Back in the browser, we're again gonna do the poor man's version of a REST client, which means let's replace the delete call with a JavaScript create function. You'll find, as always, the function down below in the video description, the source code. Essentially, we're gonna have a method called create photo. We have one photo which should be created, file name, hello.jpg. We're not sending in an ID. We're executing a fetch call to 8080 photos, man. Please replace the, the, the Z with an S if you want to in your own application. Method is going to be post. We're going to send in, and that's very important, a content type, application JSON, because we need to tell Spring Boot, hey, what type of stuff are we sending to you? And then Spring will understand application JSON means I'm getting JSON, I need to convert it to my Java object, which is a photo class, right? We're gonna send in the photo as a string in the body. And then, you know, we get some, uh, we, we, we print out whatever we get back, back from the server. Let's see what happens. We get something back, we get ID, it looks like a unique ID, file name equals null. We need to find out why that is. But first of all, let's see if something changed here with our photos call. If I just refresh the page again, I can see here is my new photo. It looks almost perfect apart from the file name. Let's find out where we had a little mistake. That means back to the IDE and here is one of those mistakes and that's why I wanted to make it. A lot of beginners go through. Don't just put the photo object here. What you actually need to do is we're sending in JSON. And again, as you might have thought by now, you need a marker annotation, right? For this whole thing to work. So what you want to do is you want to have an add request body annotation to tell Spring Boot, hey, please take the whole JSON and convert it into my photo class, right? So always make sure with these methods and the REST controllers, you have the appropriate marker annotations, request body, path variable, Gap mapping, post mapping, these are the ones that you want to basically uh, have a good understanding of. Now let's see if that was actually the trick. So I'm gonna restart my server. As always, restart browser, bam. Here we go. We're gonna, you know, refresh the page. We are re we're resetting our database with every restart. I'm gonna paste in my JavaScript function. I'm gonna execute it. Right, it worked. ID, random ID, file name, hello.jpg. Let's do it once more actually, bam. Now we have three photos in our database and we already get some rest messages back. Blah, 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 blah. We already get some JSON messages back. How cool is that? Yeah, so that's pretty nice. Even though we're just, you know, uploading metadata at the moment and not real image data, which we're gonna do in a second. But for now, we're gonna do one more thing. It has to do with validation. 
Because at the moment you can send, I mean, the ID, someone can send in an ID and it gets overwritten anyway without a random ID. But you can actually send in a photo without a file name, right? So when you open up your photos page again, and let's say we're just going to send in an empty JSON from our method here, execute that. As you can see, localhost says, well, the photo got created. We got a random ID here. The file name is null. This is obviously not what we, what we want. Instead, what we want to do is go back to your ID. We need an additional dependency. That means let's open up the POM XML file. POM XML file. As you can see, all these Spring Boot dependencies start with have the same group ID, artifact ID, Spring Boot Starter Web, Spring Boot Starter Data JDBC. And what we want to do is we want to add Spring Boot Starter Validation. Once we added the XML tag, you also want to click this icon up here in the upper right corner that IntelliJ reloads your POM XML file automatically. And as you can see, it downloads dependencies, indexes them, and now we have full-blown validation capabilities. Meaning, let's go back to our photos controller. You want to make sure, you might have guessed it, mark annotation that your photo is valid. So you just put the valid annotation here. What does valid mean? Well, let's have a look at the photo itself. We don't care about the ID at the moment, but the file name should not be empty. You can see there's a ton of different annotations again. The not empty annotation is one of them. But when you have a look at where the annotation comes from, from the libraries we just downloaded, you can see you have other mark annotations. Decimal, email, that is something should be a valid email, min, max, negative, non-empty, null, whatever, past, if you have dates, positive, positive or zero. So you can basically annotate your fields with different annotations, and then Spring Boot will be able to automatically validate whatever the user puts into your object, into the JSON. As always, let's rerun the application. Browser, let's hit enter again. And now what we get is we get a 404 error message, which is perfect because it says bad request. Something was wrong with our picture. And actually, if you want to do it once more, you can now say again, well, let me please, let's send in a file name again. So like hello world.jpg again. Send the request and you can see the request was successful. It worked. And now we have a new photo in our database. That's how easy it is to add validation to your REST controllers. All right, let's upload a real photo, not just, you know, send metadata anymore. And for that, we're going to use our browser, the browser's up, well, file chooser capabilities. Meaning back to the IDE, you now want to create a new, first of all, let's create a tiny HTML page, static HTML page under the static source main resources static folder, call it upload. And I already prepared a tiny page for you. I'm just gonna paste it in. You always will find the link down here. And it is a very simple HTML page, photo upload. It has one input field, a file input field. You can choose your files. You have an upload button, which executes an upload file method down here, not upload photo. It's an async function. What it does is basically it does a multi-part, so-called multi-part request to with some form data. The form data is your file to localhost 8080 photos, just a post. So we're not sending JSON anymore. We're now just letting the browser send a file and the browser will send the raw data. It will actually also send the file name with the whole request, which means we need to change our photos controller here because at the moment, you know, we have our valid photo request body here. We don't need that anymore. What we effectively want is a so-called multi-part file. It is what comes from Spring. It's a Spring Boot specific class. Essentially, when you do a file upload, then Spring will convert the file upload to a so-called multi-part file. And as you might have guessed, I'm repeating myself, you need a mark annotation. The mark annotation is request part from a multi-part file upload, you need to tell Spring Boot which part contains my file. Confusing? Yeah. Okay, have a look. Here we call it data. When we go back to our static HTML page, we can see that we're sending some form data, the file under the key data. This is, you know, what has to match essentially. It, it could be any other key. I'm just chose to call it data. Back to the controller, what we have is, so we're creating a new photo. How does that work? 
we're getting a file in and then what we have to do is at some point we have to create a new photo so photo photo equals new photo for now then id and file name yeah that is fine let's just think about let's just do it one by one so random id is still fine then photo set file name we're going to clean things up in a bit is we just take the file name that the browser sends in, which is conveniently part of our multipart file class. And then last but not least, what we want to do is we want to store the raw data of our photo. We're gonna store it in a database later on. We could also store it to a file, whatever. For now, I want to store it in memory. It's the quickest and easiest win for us. So actually what our photo class needs, it needs to have, we're gonna make it very, very simple. We're gonna have a byte array which contains the photo's data, right? As always, what you want to do is create a getter and setter. For that, that's fine. So now ID, file name, and data. Back to our photos controller, we're gonna do a photo set data file get bytes. Conveniently enough, also again, <clears throat> multi-part file already contains the photo's bytes. It wants to throw an exception. We can simply, you know, bubble that exception up. We would just add it to the method signature. We don't want to you know, worry about the file get bytes functionality at the moment. We can do that later. So let's double check. We get you know, the file in. Photo, ID, file name, set data. We store it in our database, in our in-memory database, meaning if we now upload a 100 megabyte file to our Java application, the memory will increase by 100 megabytes. Let me rerun, go to the browser, Instead of, you know, let's check photos. You can see it has our, the one we have saw at the moment has no data. That is absolutely fine. We want to go to upload HTML because Spring Boot is smart enough to, you know, we put upload HTML on the source main resources static. So you can just call it like that. And then let's choose a file. I'm going to go to my download directory. There seems to be a GIF I want to upload. I'm just going to click upload and I got a server error, internal server error, 500 photos. Yet again, we need to figure out what went wrong. Meaning, let's go back to our IDE. Okay, right, and what we can see is we can see a stack trace down here. There was some error message. File size limit exceeded exception. The field data exceeds its maximum permitted size of whatever, 104,000 or 1 million bytes. Now, the thing is, what I also want you to do is I want you to become comfortable with error messages that you see popping up in your console. With this, for example, what you can do is you just copy, you know, the error message like so. If you don't know what you now need to do, then you open up your browser, you search for a Spring Boot, the field data exceeds its maximum limit. You can see the top problem, someone already had that problem. Then, well, let's agree here. And then you can see, well, it looks like that Spring Boot by default sets the maximum permitted upload size to a specific amount of bytes. What you can do is you can change the configuration. This fellow is using YAML configuration, setting a property. Well, there is a ton of mil million banners popping up here. So anyway, Spring servlet multipart max file size. Let's see how we can do that. Spring servlet multipart. I'm just going to close this down. And now is the first time where we're going to have a look at the application properties file. When you step inside that properties file, you can tell, configure, you know, your Spring application just like with the file upload size. So for example, spring.servlet.multipart, and you can see IntelliJ gives you auto completion. File size, the threshold. We want to have the max file size changed, max request size, max file size. So we're just going to go, uh, the max file size should be 100 MB, maybe. We're going to do that. The request size also, we're going to change that max request size. Let's also call it 100 MB, right? Then we're just going to refresh or restart. And hopefully these values now have been taken into effect, right? So 100 MB, the file size and the request size. I'm going to send a link what the difference is between those two and open up the browser again, choose the file, GIF, upload. And now you can see it actually worked because what's happening here is there is an ID generated. The file name is, you know, the file name, 1500, whatever, the blog post. The data is basically my bytes generated 
or rather convert it to base64 string encoding. So this is my image. If I now go here and say photos, I can see this is my image. Doesn't it look, doesn't it look beautiful? It is a bit laggy here, right? But the file upload essentially worked. Now, the thing is, I don't want to get this data here. And that's what we need to fix. I want to see a real nice image. There's two things to it. First of all, when we get the metadata, we just want that Spring doesn't include the data field and sends it back to the front end. We can do that by just going back to the IDE, opening the photo class, and then Spring for the JSON conversion uses a specific library called Jackson. And what you need to do is you need to use another Jackson specific marker annotation, which is called JSON ignore. You just put it on the data field. And now whenever we send a, a photo back to the front end, the data is not going to be converted. We're not going to see it. Which means at the moment we can upload photos, but we don't get the data back. But we want to see a real photo in our browser. How are we going to do that? And this means we need to refactor our application quite a bit. Because what I want to do is, for now, there's several ways of approaching it. But let's say we want to have another additional controller. It's called Download Controller. The only thing that Download Controller does is, it's again going to be a REST controller. It has a get mapping. The get mapping is to download. And we just simply need to put in an ID of the photo we want to download and see in our browser. Only this time, what is going to happen is that we want to send raw bytes back to the browser. So for the moment, actually, what you could do is you could say, well, let's add some bytes here directly. But if in effect, I'm going to show you something else, which is called response entity. We want to have, we want to send back a response entity, which wraps bytes. Because there's the bytes and there's also some HTTP headers that we want to send back, including the file name, for example, of this file that we are basically requesting. It will make sense in a second. So we're going to have a download method, as always, marker annotation, a path variable called ID. So we want to request a specific photo and we want to send back a response entity in turn. When I say new response entity, whoops, that was something else, new response entity, I need to put in my bytes here. So I need to have the data here somewhere. I need to have my headers somewhere. And I want to send back an HTTP status. If everything worked correctly, we're just going to send back OK. Let's create the data that comes from our photo, from our database. We also want some headers, right? So we're just going to create a multi-value map. Actually, in effect, there's also something else. What we could do is Let's see, there's a specific class that Spring Framework offers, HTTP headers. Headers equals new HTTP headers, right? And we want to send some specific, as I said, file name, we want to send it back to the client. Now the question is, first of all, before we complete this journey here, how do we get our photo? And this is the first time we're going to learn about dependency injection in Spring. Dependency injection, what does it mean? Well, let's find out for example when you go to the photos controller you can see that the photos controller has a database that database isn't because it's a private variable of our photos controller isn't available in our download controller we could obviously make it public or instead what we could do is we could say well when you layer your applications for example then you have your controllers and the controllers, what they do is they convert JSON back to some objects, right? Or extract the path variables and they send back some JSON. But what they don't really do is talk to the database correctly. For that, you could create a so-called service class. So we're going to create a photos service class. Again, we need to tell Spring, hey, this is kind of a special class. Please do something with it. Meaning instantiate it for us whenever you boot up the application. We can do that with a mark annotation called add component. There's another one which is called add service. They both do the very same thing, just that add service is a bit more readable for humans, but you can actually choose to use either one of those two annotations. So component add service works fine. I'm just going to go with add service here. Now Spring knows on startup, well, hold on. I'm not just going to have a look at my REST controllers. 
I'm also going to have a look at my photo service because it needs to be instantiated as a service. Now, what can we do? We can go from the photos controller and just, you know, move the database into our photos service. So now instead of, you know, asking the controller directly, the map inside the controller, give me some DB values, give me the specific photo for an ID, remove something. We actually need to tell the photos controller, hey, photos controller, ask a so-called photos service, photo service. I'm going to create a constructor which receives a photo service and sets that photo service here inside the photos controller. And then instead of, you know, asking the DB, the hash map, we're just going to go photo service, um, get, for example, or find all, whatever you like. It's a method we have yet to create. So we're just going to, I'm just going to create that method here, right? And we have to fix it in a second. But when you go back, what you can now see is that you essentially have some sort of delegation inside here. Your photos controller doesn't know about the database anymore. It knows about the photo service. And then it asks the photo service, please give me all the photos you know. It doesn't matter if those photos come from a database, they come from a file system, from S3, whatever. The controller doesn't change. Now the question is, how does the photos controller actually get a photo service instance? And you already know all the bits and pieces about that because, as I said, on startup, Spring scans your entire package and has a look at specific classes like REST controller and says, hey, okay, let's create a new REST controller where the methods respond to HTTP calls. The same thing goes with, it says, well, there is a constructor which has a requirement. It needs a photo service. That's called so-called constructor injection. Do I know a photo service? And then Spring scans your class and says, well, I have a class called photo service. It's even annotated with the add service annotation. So why don't I just create a new photo service, just one, a single instance, a so-called singleton of that, and inject it into my photos controller here. And then the photos controller can call any method on that service as it wants. If you, you might have already seen that you know, in the past, if you do different sorts of, there's different sorts of injection styles in Spring. For example, you can direct, you know, field injection where you say add auto wired and you can, don't have to have a constructor. You can just do it like this. This has the same effect. Or when you do constructor injection, you actually don't need to have the um, auto wired annotation, although it doesn't hurt. So that is essentially the same thing. Put auto wired here. They're all the same, various ways of achieving the same thing meaning inject a photo service into my photos controller. The same thing, by the way, if you just copy and paste that here, photos controller, the download controller needs the same thing. So you're just gonna paste it in here. We're gonna fix the error. And now your download controller also gets a photo service injected and can use the photo service in a second to retrieve a specific photo. It's a whole lot of photos that I'm mentioning here. Now what we need to do is a couple of things. Where we called DB inside here, we now need to, you know, always call a method in photo service and those methods don't yet exist. And what I like to do is, by the way, as you can see, I don't have a problem with red. What I want to do is always, I want IntelliJ to tell me, hey, uh, please fix it for me. In this case, let's create a new method, get in photo service and IntelliJ will create the method for me. When I have a look at the remove method, it also doesn't exist. IntelliJ will create it for me. When I look at the save method, it doesn't yet exist. IntelliJ will create it for me. Nice and simple. Download controller later on. We're gonna fix that in a second, but first of all, let's fix our photo service. What should this method here do? Well, the get method, the collection, it does, DB values, right? We can just copy and paste the code from before. The get method with an ID basically does return DB get ID, or otherwise it returns null. Remove, what does remove do? It does return DB remove ID. Nice and simple. And save. Here we're just going to copy and paste the code. We're just going to take that put it into our photo service. And we have to rearrange things a tiny bit because 
the ID is being automatically generated. Let's do it like so. We're gonna say we're gonna take a file name and we're gonna take the data. So we're gonna change it a tiny bit, the file name, the data, and we're gonna return the photo. And also we're gonna put the photo into photo get ID. I deleted that call into our database. And we're also gonna make sure we return the photo like so. Now the call should do this file, get original file name, file, get bytes, right? We get a photo back, a photo back like so. And this is it. We're going to inline the variable so it looks nice and tidy. But what we effectively now did is we replaced all our hard coded calls to some database to a photo service. And the Photos controller and the Download controller, both of them are using the very same instance of the photo service. And that is what the constructor injection and the whole dependency injection topic is about. Actually, let's quickly fix up our download controller. It's not yet working, but we're just gonna, you know, put a new byte here. And I just wanna see if everything is still working as expected. So we're gonna restart the application and see if there's any error messages popping up. If we did something wrong, it actually looks like, you know, stuff is still up and running. Go to the browser, refresh photos, please, not now. Never translate this site, localhost 8080. Photos, you can see that works. We got rid of our data um, stuff that we did before. And we can actually still, you know, uh, search for a specific photo, get old photos, remove the photos, create new ones. That works as expected. So our dependency injection is working perfectly. Time to fix the download controller. Meaning at the moment, what we do is in our download controller, we get in an ID. Well, you might have guessed what we're going to do now. Photo service get, we're going to try to get a photo for that specific ID. If the photo is null, remember back to these exceptions that we're throwing, throw new response status exception. We want to send a not found. See, the, um, I'm just typing in IntelliJ, whatever auto completes everything there is. So if there's no photo, then just return a 404. That's fine. Now, interestingly, the bytes, very simple, is just photos get data, right? That gives you all the bytes back. Which means we're almost that we can almost download our photos because we're setting them here, data, we're sending the HTTP setters, okay. Some headers are missing. Now, the thing is with the headers that are missing, there's, let's say, two things we need to do. First of all, we need to say that our photo is of a specific content type. That would be nice. So we need to actually send back image JPEG uh, or we, uh, PNG or whatever have you. And we don't store that content type yet. We still have to fix that in a second. So there must be something like actually back in our photo. You can see I'm, I'm always kind of, it's like chaos coding. When something happens, I just, you know, write it down. And then I think, oh, I quickly, I need that. So we're just going to put it in here, spring, not spring, string content type. Someone needs to send in also, right? Like so. We need a content type from our photo. And then later on in our download controller, we just get it. The content type is, and here's some spring specific uh, methods I'm using, media type, value of, you have, you have to know all this stuff by heart, kind of. Uh, don't worry about it if, if you think, how did he come up with that? But I want to send um, basically photo get content type back to the browser. So the other browser knows, for example, it's a GIF, it's a PNG, it's whatever. There's one other thing it needs, the browser. The browser needs a file name because it doesn't have a file name at the moment. So we need to send a header with the file name. And also if the browser should display the photo in the browser or automatically download it. And the way you do that is basically with a something which is called content disposition. So content disposition, we need to build a new one. Again, it's just basically a spring specific wrappers about HTTP specific header methods. Now, what we want to do is we want to call builder 
And we're going to go, um, yeah, it's going to be an attachment. Please, do, please browser download the image. Don't display it. Otherwise, you could just put inline here and the browser would display it automatically. So builder.attachment. Then we're going to put the file name there also. The file name comes from the photo. So we're just going to say file name, photo get file name. And what else do we need? I don't think we need anything else. We just can, you know, rearrange stuff a bit. Download the file, get file name set it as header and send it back to the browser. Perfect, which means content type is the last thing we need to do. The content type, now imagine again, the browser uploads the file with the file name and the content type. We just need to save it once it's being created. We're gonna do that by going to Photos Controller. In Photos Controller, where we're saving the file, we can say, well, save the file name, save the content type. Also, that method doesn't yet exist because it just had two parameters a second ago. What we're gonna do is we're gonna let IntelliJ add another parameter to the method. Like so, just hitting Alt Enter. You can see the parameter is here. It's not being used at the moment. It is gonna be used in a moment because we're gonna just gonna set it here, set the content type, and we're good to go. Wow, that was quite a lot. Let's see if something is working. Which means we're going to restart, as always, restart the application and go to the browser. <laughs> Triple check. We want to do photos one. Yes, the photo is here. It has no content type. That's absolutely fine because that's our mock photo. Then let's go to upload.html. Let's choose a file. Let's choose our blog post GIF. Let's upload the file. Wow. Let's see what happened. ID. This is the ID. Actually, let's copy the ID. That would be <laughs> interesting. Copy the ID. The file name is here. The content type is being stored. That worked flawlessly. Now let's see what happens. Slash download slash ID. What happens? Do you think it's going to work? Well, let's find out. Actually, my browser just downloaded a file. It looks like the GIF. And yes, it actually is the GIF. Don't worry about the GIF. Everything we just built just is randomly working. Let's do a quick recap. We built a couple of controllers, download controller, photos controller. We have an application class, service, and a so-called model class. At the moment, it all lives in one folder or in one package rather. And what I want you to do is I want you to refactor your project a bit so it, it's a bit more idiomatic. And the way to do that is introduce a couple of packages. For example, there's many different ways of you know, uh, doing that. But uh, you have the web folder, you have the package, the service package, you have the model package, for example. And what you're going to do now is your controllers, you just move them inside the web package, your photo inside the model package, your service inside the service package, your application is at the top. And that is, you know, a good starting structure. There's a many different ways of doing that. But in a tiny project, in our case, let's just have that as a default package structure and you're good to go for the future. Let's start using a real database. When you look at your photo service at the moment, you can see that it has a map and it stores your photos inside memory, inside a plain old hash map. We want to access a database. As I said at the very beginning, what we did is, when you have a look at the POMXML file, we added an H2 database. And the funny thing is the H2 database is just a Java library. And once you add it to your project, Spring Boot will automatically boot it up once you start Spring Boot. And then you will have an in-memory database. You won't see it, there won't be any files or whatever, but you can actually use it as you would with Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. The thing is, it, by default, it's only available in memory, but you can also tell H2 or Spring to save the database contents to a file so you can actually see it and have the impression that, you know, something is being saved at least. The way you do that is, again, application properties. There's a new property data source URL. You need to tell Spring Boot where to save your database file. Again, I'm going to paste in something here. You'll find it down below. JDBC H2 file in your home directory into a file called hello2 or something else. So let's call it Spring Boot, for example. And also server true is just some option you can ignore for now. That means whenever we now boot up the application, hopefully let's try that. Let's 
just run, rerun this application. Spring Boot boots up. Well, haha. A database is being created. Home directory, Spring Boot. Let's see if that is actually true. I'm just going to open up Explorer. I'm going to go to my home directory. And as you can see, there's a file called Spring Boot Lock. There's actually two files being created. Database files, .log.mv. This is your database. And then you can just copy it to any server and then reuse it effectively, just like SQLite. But you only need Java for it to run. Okay, so we have that. We have a database. Let's think about, we want to store our photos in a database, which means we need to have some tables. Again, Spring Boot has various ways of, for example, when you boot up Spring Boot, that it should check that there are some tables already in the database, and if not, it, it creates them. Options are Flyway and Liquibase. These are basically more full-blown options. You might have heard of them. We're not going to cover them now. We're just going to go with the most basic Spring micro database migration tools available. For that, you're going to go to the Resources folder, create a new file, and call, call the file schema SQL. Now it's time to get your SQL skills out. Create table if not exists. Sounds like a plan. We're going to call the table photos. Just once more. There's going to be an ID. Let's say the ID is a big int identity, which means it's being auto generated. It's a primary key also. We're going to have a file name. The file name, let's say for now, it's just a Varchar 255 characters. We're going to have a content type. So essentially, you can see this is mapping our photos Java class that we have up here, photos ID, file name, content type in the data, mapping them to a database table. Schema SQL, uh, what else do we need? We need a data, and that is of type binary. Now, depending on if you're using MySQL or Postgres, you might ha have slightly different uh, table creation statements, but if you're following along, this should essentially work. Create table if not exists photos. And now once more, there's one last property we need to, new, uh, to, to use for our project. It's called spring SQL init mode equals always. And in short, there are specific configurations like in prod and whatever, when spring doesn't execute the, the schema SQL files. For now, I want it to always, whenever we boot it up, I want the schema SQL to be executed. Now let's actually see if that works. So we're just gonna, you know, rerun the application and we get an error message. The error message is create tables not exist photos. There seems to be a problem expected identifier. And this is a good moment to again, make use of an IDE. You saw me typing this blind. I got two messages here saying SQL dialect is not configured. IntelliJ, I can actually tell IntelliJ, hey, my file is an H2 file, SQL dialect. And then IntelliJ can already give me some hints if something is working or isn't working. So that looks actually fine. I don't yet know what the error, error is. Maybe I do. But in any case, what I want to do is I want to be able to access the database. Now, the thing is, again, with IntelliJ, you could have pretty nice database access built into the IDE. The poor man's version is this. Actually, H2, the database, comes with a web interface. You only have to enable it. You enable it by adding a new property, spring.console.enabled equals true. So what we're going to do now is let's just quickly rename schema to, to backup schema so that spring doesn't execute the file, which is going to copy the contents. We are going to restart the application, right? See if the application starts up again. You can see there's also h2 console available at slash h2 console. That looks promising. So browser, meaning here now browser, let's open up h2 console like so. That looks perfect. Now again, we can simply connect to a, uh, to a database file here. In our case, what we want to do is we call our file spring boot. Let's test the connection. Wrong username password. That's right, because I don't think we had a username password. You just have to delete it. We're going to connect to a database. And then you can see we have our information schema here. We have a user here, <laughs> an empty user, and we can execute SQL statements right inside here, which means let's get back our SQL statement, paste it in here and see what's wrong. So I just did that. Let me take it. We're going to run it. We can see 
That actually worked. We now have a photos table. ID, file name, content type data seems to be there. Let's just quickly drop the table, drop table photos. Let's see what was wrong. We're just gonna delete it again. That seemed to work fine. Double checking here. Are we missing a semicolon? Let's find out. Back schema, SQL, like so. Let's restart. Yeah, and that seemed to have worked. So it was just a semicolon at the end. That took me ages to find out previously. So it, sometimes it's just the small things. Now, create table does not exist photos. Let's quickly double check in our console. We're connecting again, photos, it's here. We can do a select star from photos and there should, not, there should be nothing inside. So no, we're getting no rows back at the moment. That's fine because that's what we are gonna change now. The easiest way to get started with the database stuff, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Spring Data JDBC. The only thing that happens JDBC is the, the low level API to send database statements from Java to the database, right? And Spring Data is, let's say, a tiny comfort wrapper around that JDBC API. And you don't have to read 10 books like you have to do with JPA and Hibernate, even though you think you might not have to, and get started rather easily. Now, Spring Data is its all own concept essentially, but I'm going to give you a tiny quick start again. Spring Data wants you to create repositories, so-called repositories. So we're just going to create a class and we're going to call the class in the repository package, which does not yet exist. We're just going to call it photos repository. I already regret that I appended the Z to everything that I have here. And now it shouldn't be uh, an inter it should be an interface and it extends an already existing interface that comes from Spring Data. It's called a CRUD repository. The CRUD repository gives, gives you a ton of methods like find all, delete, save into a database without you having to write them. That's quite nifty and quite handy. Obviously you can write your own SQL statements, but for now I just want you to get started with the CRUD repository and get the basic find all, find by ID and you know update statements working. What is the ID field in the database, right? We set it to integer. And then there's also the object itself, which should return you photos. And that's all you need to do. And then Spring Boot is smart enough to figure out, hey, you have CRUD repositories. When you step inside, you can see that you have save, you have find all, exist by, find all, all, all these count. You have them, they are transactional by default. Transaction is a whole other topic. Well, I'm going to find some nice reading links in the description below to get you up to speed with that. But in short, Spring, when it uh, boots up, <coughs> scans the repository, finds out that there are CRUD repositories. It generates those SQL statements for you. So your database calls work. This is one part. The second part is marker annotations. <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to kind of map our Java class to our database table. So first of all, another annotation, Spring Data specific. Table, it's going to be the photos table. I'm going to make it uppercase here because H2 converts every table by default, as you saw before, to uppercase. So we're just going to say, hey, the photos live in the photos table. Then we need a mark annotation to tell Spring what is the ID field. This is the ID field. It's not going to be a string anymore. It's going to be an auto generated integer, right? I think we can delete that construct actually. Let's find out what's being used. String file name by default. What's going to happen is that Spring converts these camel case names, file name, content type to file underscore name, content underscore type. And we actually have that in our schema SQL file. So that should be working perfectly. <laughs> Data is also fine. And in fact, everything should be working as expected. Let's see. We're just going to quickly change the type here from string to integer like so. Right. Let's see what we need to fix. What we need to do is change our photos service. The photo service, and that is the nice thing about having the dependency injection working is now encapsulated. All the other classes stay the same. We just need to fix the photo service. First of all, we need to give the photo service a photos repository. Photos repository, it should be automatically injected like so. Then what we're gonna do is return photos repository, find all, right? This should return us all the photos. Actually, see, I made a, I just made a mistake. It says require type collection photo provide iterable integer. I want to get back to my photos repository because I swapped these two parameters around in the wrong direction. 
So it must be, first of all, the object and then the ID. So photo integer. Now it should be better. Fine, all. Let's see what it returns. Require type collection photo provided iterable photo. That is because string data methods return you iterables instead of collections. And you can just quickly fix that like so. You change the return type of the method. That's absolutely fine. Same thing with down here. Return photos repository. Find by ID. We just want to put the ID in here or else null because the method returns an optional, right? Optional. And here the ID should be integer as well. So we're just going to quickly change that. Here, what we're going to do is let's see photos repository delete. Let's do delete by ID. Again, we need an integer ID like so. And we're not going to return a photo anymore because I don't think that delete by ID returns your photo, right? Like so. Last but not least, in our safe call, we're not setting an ID anymore. That should come from the database being automatically generated. Now, what we're going to do, however, is we're going to call photos repository save, right? And then in here, we're just going to put our photo in here, like so. So photo content type file name data, just save it to the database. Don't ask me about it anymore. Let's see what we have to do with those problems here. So first of all, the get call again, we need to make sure to return iterable here. Spring will know what to do. Up next, we have get by ID. Well, we're just going to change the type to an integer. That should work. Sp Spring Boot is smart enough to actually do the conversion for us. Integer also. Here, we're not going to return anything anymore. So we're just going to swallow the result. We're always going to give back a 200 and don't worry about if the photo exists or doesn't exist anymore. That should look okay. The only a reason why we had to change our controller now is because we changed the type from the you know string ID to integer ID. But let's see what else. One related problem we have, right? Our download controller, download controller, same thing here. We're just gonna put integer ID here, and everything else should basically work as expected. Let's have a quick look at everything at all the classes inside here. Let's see if we can finally do something, save something to database. Let's rerun the application. Let's find out if I missed anything. Application booted up. Browser. Localhost 8080. Hello world. That was a long time ago. Photos. It's empty. That looks like actually that something got it actually returns the data from the database, which isn't anything at the moment. Let's go to upload HTML. Choose a file. Choose my GIF. Choose upload. Again, that seems to have worked. Okay, let's actually have a look at photos again. Photos tells me there is an image in my database. And now let's find out what happens when I go to the H2 console. Select star from photos. Ah, it wants me to log in again. Let's just quickly connect again. Photos. Yes, select star from photos. There is a photo in the database, ID number one, file name, image type, the data itself. Isn't that cool? And by the way, download number one. Let's do it. The photo comes directly from the database. I can open it up. Everything works. We have the full round trip working, meaning we have a database connected to our REST API. The front end can send stuff. The browser can send stuff to REST API, saves it to a database and we can actually return that stuff again. And if you want to, you can, you know, upload the file now 20 million times. Okay, and then refresh your H2 database and you can see new rows are being inserted. Now, the thing is, let's sum things up quickly before we deploy our application. We ignored a ton of stuff. We have to make sure we have validation. We have to make sure we sanitize our data. We have to make sure to limit our data properly. All that sort of stuff, you know, from in, in a real world application. I'll put more links in the description below telling you how to do all that. But for me, the most important part is seeing the stuff in the database at the very end. Which means it's about time to deploy our application. What does deployment mean? Now, open up a terminal window. In fact, if you're using IntelliJ, what you also could do is the quick shortcut instead of opening up the terminal window, open up the Maven toolbox window, Photos clone lifecycle package, and that's all you need to do. You just double click it. If you're not using IntelliJ and you just want to see it to be done on the command line, 
enter Maven W, the Maven wrapper. Remember at the very beginning inside your project, Maven clean package. If you do that, make sure that you have your Java home environment variable set up to the exact same Java version that you're building your project with. Yeah, otherwise you might run into problems. But in my case, I only have Java 17 installed. The project is set to Java 17. You can see clean package compiles my source code, runs some tests, does something and at the end after 10 seconds, it tells me build successful. What does that mean? Now, if I choose, go inside the target folder, which is it's a standard Maven build folder, so to speak, you go inside, you can see that you have a jar file in here. That jar file has a couple of bytes, megabytes, and I can simply go now and take this jar file, put it onto a server, onto my friend's machine, anywhere I want to, and simply run it. That is my deployment. Send it to your investor, let him run the file. How do you run the file? Java-jar photos clone. You just do it like this. This is one line you need to execute, and then your application boots up. It's now not started in the IDE, it's just in the terminal window. And once I go open up a browser again, you can see here is my application. I can have a look at the photos. They're still in my database because I'm accessing the same database on my file system in my home directory. And that is all you need to know to package up your application at the end, Maven Clean Package. And you have a char file, you can run it with a simple command. And that is Spring Boot in a nutshell. We didn't cover a ton of topics like testing, for example, everything that has to do with testing further database access and whatnot. The thing is, it took me years to understand the whole ecosystem. I hope I gave you a quick, nice and easy jumpstart into the whole universe. You'll find plenty of reading resources, what's next resources in the video's description. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I can only say sayonara. Bye.